Well, she's, well, she's my daughter. Hello and welcome back to the Doctor Who Marathon. I'm your host, Gidam, and today we're going to be talking about The Doctor's Daughter, written by Stephen Greenhorn and is directed by Alice Troughton. This was a very um, uh, anticipated story when uh, Series 4 came out, when people got uh, whiff of the title. Um, they were very highly anticipated. It was also announced um, that Martha would be in this story after her appearance in the Santaran Stratagem and the Poison Sky, after, uh, after which the story, that story left on a cliffhanger leading into this. Uh, but mainly uh, is the concept of the Doctor's daughter. And a lot of fan theories um, came around by this. But what, um, what captured the audience's... Um, excitement for this adventure is the casting of Georgia Moffat as um, the particular the title character of the Doctor's Daughter. For those of you who don't know, Georgia Moffat is a proclaimed actress. Um, she's appeared in a few small roles like um, The Bill and she later had some few in the Big Finish audio dramas. But what makes her stand out in terms of Doctor Who fans is that she is actually the daughter of Peter Davison, the fifth Doctor, who had, at this point, recently um, appeared in the series in the short little um, Children in Need special, Time Crash. So whether she got the role because of, of connections and there's all that tie-up in there, uh, who's to say? But uh, we do know that originally she was uh, meant to audition for Rose Tyler, however... The production team thought that she might have been a bit too young then to play um, to play Rose, so Georgia Moffat didn't get that role. But instead, she got the role of her playing the Doctor's daughter. This would also be a, uh, an important in terms of uh, just real real life events, as this would be the first meeting between Georgia Moffat and David Tennant. For those of you who don't know, later on in life, they actually became a couple, got married, and had four kids, um, with David Tennant actually adopting Georgia Moffat's uh, first son, uh, Ty Moffat, who's now named uh, Ty Tennant. So that is just um, really cool. I'm ha very happy for them. Um, the idea that Georgia Moffat's father is the Doctor, she's marrying the Doctor, she's the Doctor's daughter and has the Doctor's kids. It's so meta, it's so bizarre. And in the story, she's also the daughter of the Doctor, but also, but more specifically, the 10th Doctor, which is her husband in real life. It's so bizarre. And that's mainly... Um, what people remember about this story is that Georgia Moffat's in it and she plays the Doctor's daughter, but she's also is the Doctor's daughter in real life, but she's also married to David Tennant. It's um, a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, tiny-whiny. But in terms of the actual story itself, the actual narrative that we are presented in this story, um, a lot of people uh, who have actually given this story a watch and try seem to a majority of people, I'm not saying there are people who don't like this story, uh, who do like the story, there are people who do like the story, but for the most part, I don't think it's any, uh, it's not controversial to say that this story isn't particularly liked. Um, a lot of people just downright hate it, some people find it dull and uninteresting, some people find it um, irritating, and overall just don't think it's just an, uh, an, uh, a good piece of, of, of television. I remember when it first aired, I actually really enjoyed it. Um, as a Doctor Who fan, there are many references to the Doctor's family and his uh, relationship with uh, uh, with uh, Georgia Moffat's character, I thought was interesting at the time. Um, however, I have listened to a lot of opinions and a lot of stuff that I have uh, noticed along the way. And so I have had this... Um, this relationship with this episode where the more I watch it um, uh, before, the more I pick up on stuff that that I'm not particularly a fan of or stuff which I think could have been done a lot better. However, um, uh, for this uh, marathon, I'm going to put all of that to the side. Just watch it, try and get, try to just have my own personal opinion on this story 
and just fingers crossed that I enjoyed because I really want, I do not want to go into a story hoping I'll hate it. Whoever does that, whoever acts like that are just complete idiots. But, um, uh, but even if you like, you know, you're going to watch something which uh, you might not enjoy. It's always good to at least leave the door open for yourself to enjoy it, to have your opinions changed. So I went into this story knowing that it's not a particularly light story. I hadn't seen it in a few years um, prior to watching it for the marathon and I just wanted to go in this with a breath of fresh air and hope that I can find a lot of things to enjoy about it. Um, so the story uh, kicks off uh, literally um, coming right after the conclusion of the previous story in which uh, the TARDIS has just some for some reason um, taken the, uh, the control away from the Doctor and dematerialized on this planet. I believe it's called Merillium, um, but I'm not. Gonna, I'm just going to call it the planet in this uh, in this vlog if I need to discuss it. Um, and it's uh, the Doctor did not take them there. They don't know how they're there, why they're there, why the Doctor is a part of these events, um, and. We get then everybody, all the TARDIS team, just looking outside um, this tunnel that they've arrived in. And the Doctor's like, why is the TARDIS taking us here? Why is um, Donna and Martha just talk about how exciting it is to come out of the TARDIS, um, uh, to experience this new world that could be incredibly dangerous or could be incredibly fascinating. But when you just step out those doors, you don't know where you are yet. And... And that thrill, that excitement um, is there. However, they quickly get ambushed by a group of soldiers who are surprised by the fact they are, uh, they are complete anomalies. They seem really healthy. There's no scarring on the hands and there's no uh, mud. And the, one of them actually grabs the doctor and takes his hand into a processing machine. And the doctor's just like, what are you doing? What are you taking my hand for? Why, what's wrong with clean hands? That should be on a t-shirt. Um, but anyway, this extrapolates some of his DNA. Um, uh, they say sometimes cloning, but then sometimes they describe it as a as a process of of a biological system where uh, one individual is both mother and father, which is not too similar to cloning. But for uh, the mainstream, it is basically the same thing. But um, if you're a science expert, that might annoy you. And out from this machine comes a fully grown human, uh, uh, gr a fully grown person. Uh, as we get introduced to Georgia Moffat's character, Jenny, the Doctor's daughter. As the, the title sequence ends with the Doctor basically announcing that this woman is uh, his daughter. Uh, technically, on a technical level. The same blood, same DNA in the same way as a mother, uh, mother is to a child or father is to a child but just because there's blood doesn't mean that they're really connected it just means that um uh that they got the same blood so basically this story is about nature versus nurture in that regard and um right off the bat jenny the the main focal point of this story is the relationship between the doctor and jenny now to say it's completely bad I completely write it off is um, is a bit dumb, is a bit silly. There are some things to, to like about a relationship. Specifically, it's how the Doctor reacts and how the Doctor is, how his emotional attachment to this character is, or lack of. Um, as the story, basically, he starts off not liking Jenny, seeing her as just this soldier um, that has nothing to do with him. Sure, she has the same... DNA the same blood as him but overall uh, because of the way this machine has brought up in which um, they get this instant memory of warfare and and the, and the history of these people the doctor doesn't consider her um, a part of him in that regard in an emotional capacity and it's up to basically Donna as um, as in the earlier on in the episode um, there's a, we basically learn that there is a war going on, this massive war between the human race uh, made out of these clone uh, machines and the Hoth, which are also using these clone machines. And 
something happens which destroys the tunnel, leaving uh, uh, Martha and the TARDIS on the side of the hearth, whilst the Doctor, uh, Donna and Jenny are stuck on the human side as Doctor and Marth, uh, Doctor and Donna learn about this environment and learn about this um, this culture and this and this place. Um, and I think in terms of the Doctor's relationship here, it is the, easily the most fascinating. And I don't mean it like it's the most fascinating because everything else is so terrible and this is just sort of all right. I mean, this is generally good stuff. Um, there's a bit where they're in a prison and, and uh, the Doctor's basically coming up with plans, coming up with theories, coming up with ways to stop um, each of the wars, uh, war infections into her headed into a bloodbath and Jenny is basically she's enthused she's enthralled by the fact that the doctor despite um, hating soldiers and wants nothing to do with it and, and despises the very concept of being a soldier himself Jenny is just like you are a soldier your main goal is um, getting involved in a war to try and stop it isn't that what every soldier technically is doing and it even catches up with the doctor and doctor doesn't know really know to reply and uh Donna kind of helps their relationship with um, uh, with each other, and the Doctor kind of takes uh, slowly and surely takes this liking. And this is actually a really strong element of the story, as the Doctor's um, relationship with her uh, doesn't automatically come, but it slowly progresses throughout the story. Um, as Jenny is excited to hear about these new worlds, these new places, and uh, Donna basically helps uh the doctor to say it's like right she can come uh she can come with us but there's also a moments where she just cannot refuse to call to arms she gets a gun and tries to um harm people who are behind her behind them um and the doctor's just like look she's just a soldier there's also some really great fascinating scenes uh one again in the prison is when the Doctor basically is like, right, she's just this clone. She has nothing to do with me. She is not a Time Lord. She has um, uh, she has no history, no uh, none of the shared pain that the Time Lords, the, uh, the creed of a Time Lord, that you are not a Time Lord. You are just an echo of what they are. But Donna makes him hear her heartbeats to reveal that she has two heartbeats. She is a Time Lord uh, genetically anyway. As the Doctor, I love the scene, the Doctor just slowly walks back into the corner and David Tennant's portrayed, he really just lowers his voice. He's very uh, relaxed, uh, but he, the pain is still in his voice as he basically describes the Time War and how he was a soldier then and how he was forced to kill his own people. And, and Jenny, in a way, is kind of a resemblance of that. And that is just such a powerful scene. And David Tennant just knocks it out of the park. Um, uh, there's also a scene later on where the, the, the relationship does seem to be uh, getting healthier. Um, uh, Jenny, at one point, um, plans to fire on the humans that are chasing them and planning on killing them. However, she refuses. She uh, uses the gun to hit something to distract them. However, she... Um, it's perfectly fine. We also get this really stupid scene um, with the lasers. If you've seen this episode, you know what I'm on about, about the lasers. Really, really dumb. <laughs> but um, it leads into the Doctor basically looking at her and seeing that she does have the potential for good. She does have the potential to uh, shred away her soldier history uh, to a point where uh, she can become her his idolised... Uh, child but then and it all seems all good and proper and Donna seems to be like right um look at you I can see it in your eyes you're nervous because you're just a uh, shock of a father I've seen it hundreds of times and it's here where the doctor kind of breaks down again not like like a thing but he kind of like lowers his voice again and tells Donna that he has been a father before and he lost that a long time ago and the part of him that cared that a part of him that was part of that family died with them and every time he looks at Jenny every time he sees her with this enthusiasm um, that resembles his family and himself 
it hurts him inside. And Donna just sits in that, uh, talks to him and just like, that pain, it won't be there forever. Jenny and I are on the TARDIS. We will help you grow and, and, uh, and that pain will not be there. And we can help you heal and help you understand. Donna here, is, her role is, we'll get more on Donna later. But anyway, back to um, the Doctor. So this story is mainly a Doctor story. It's one of the few occasions where the Doctor does actually have a sort of character arc in that sense where he has to learn something about himself and the relationship he has. Um, and his stubbornness because, you know, he has been in a family before and it's hurt him that he's now lost anything, everything. I personally got teared up inside because I, as a fan, grew up with... You know, with the stories anyway of Susan and, um, and I actually started watching like all the episodes of Susan. So I've known that relationship now with the Doctor and Susan and his grandchild. And there is that kind of not a not a, not that they like similar anyway, but there is this um, glimmer, this glow of Susan within Georgia Moffat's performance. Um, whether she took a little bit of inspiration or uh, maybe I'm just seeing too much into it, I don't know. But that is just some great um, character work and great character development for the Doctor. Now, you might notice something here. I am constantly mentioning how this stuff is so great for the Doctor. Because Jenny herself, as a character, is kind of dull. She, uh, she is the... The stereotype, uh, born sexy, yesterday um, archetype, which was very popular in the mid 2000s. Uh, in the, from like the, uh, whenever Buffy the Vampire Slayer came out, or all the way into like um, the late uh, 2000s. And Jenny is a part of those archetypes and those textures. But there's nothing really there after that. Sure, she has her relationship with the Doctor, but it's so clear that she is meant as a one-off character. Um, and apart from her relationship with the Doctor, with um, and how she basically is taunted him, um, she doesn't really have anything interesting to do apart from looking googly and like, I can't wait to, I can't wait to do all that running again. I can't wait to see all those amazing planets. She's so googly-eyed that that there's just nothing really interesting about her and that is one of the greatest problems with the story is that Jenny is just really dull as a person, as a as a character. Whether this is uh, due to the writing, because there are some great writing moments here with her, especially the moments where, like I said, when uh, her character relates with the Doctor. Um, whether it's to do with some writing issues or whether it's Georgia Moffat's performance here. Now, I don't want to take away, like, Georgia Moffat. I'm sure she is fantastic in other things. I'm sure she is a great actress. I recently um, watched her in uh, Stage, that comedy uh, show that David Tennant and Michael Sheen done. Um, uh, for a small role than that, she seems to be very competent as an actress. Um, but here... I, I, I hate to say that it's a that it's her that's the issue not like you know I hope she gets better I hope she's thinking but here I don't think she's particularly strong here as an actress or at least she's not given much to do because really in terms of her performance she's just smiling and googly lying and is kind of basic in that regard and the fact that she is supposed to be one of the main uh, main parts of this story and one of the emotional hooks for the doctor is actually a massive problem. Uh, one of many problems, but I think that is the main issue, the main um, a main point that detractors of this story point out. And it is something which, sadly, I disagree. I will say, though, however, when I first watched this episode back in 2008, I loved Jenny. So I might just be an age thing, a lot of... Um, younger people might enjoy her um, and that'll be something which um, 
I guess it depends on person to person. She does have her fans. She does have her. Um, she does have people that enjoy her performance. But for the most part, I think a lot of people can agree that Jenny herself just isn't just an interesting aspect of this story. But anyway, let's get on to um, the war itself and how Martha and the rest of the, the human race's uh, aspects. We basically learn that there is a, uh, these races basically make just a bunch of clones every so often and they name them in the group's generations. Um, and we learn that this is war that broke out between the human and the half because um, they could not... Uh, well, the humans, anyway, tell um, the Doctor, the, this leader character, who's incredibly dull. He's a com com completely cliched general archetype. Um, but the actor who plays him kind of feels really bored by this role. Um, and he basically states that, um, from what he can gather, uh, humans and Hoth did have a peace. But for some unknown reasons, the Hoth just betrayed them, uh, couldn't keep the peace. And so there is... Um, uh, this war breaking out between the human and half for this planet and um, they're also looking for something known as the source which they believe is the breath of God which will uh, or goddess shall I say because there's a scene where Jenny is like um, goddess I, I, I like that um, uh, that breath that has this uh, this massive weapon which the humans and the hearth wants to try and and end the war to, to destroy the other side and uh, these people are very intense at least the human aspects the humans are the villains in this story they are the ones who are violently vicious against the hearth and our main characters and do anything in their power to try and stop them the hearth can kind of come off as neutral in this story as we see with Martha she actually helps one of the hearth uh, with his broken arm and and they kind of befriend her and they come into this um, uh, this relationship with her where they take her on into their base and um, they basically treat her as, as one of them as they all like grab her shoulder and stuff. Now the half of these fish like uh, beings who uh, have this very interesting design where they're kind of like fish heads with these gills and they kind of have like these sheep eyes and they kind of got these like tanks around their mouth. I don't know how that works in terms of genetics. Are they born with tanks on their mouths? Is it something that they are later adapted to? I don't know. But either way, they speak by bubble speech, in which, because um, in their tanks they have like this liquid and when they talk it bubbles up. So the hearth themselves don't have any dialogue and instead just speak by this uh, bubble. It's strange how the TARDIS telepathic circuits don't translate for the audience. For seemingly Martha can understand them. Uh, it's very strange. It's very odd. I don't know if there's something wrong in the editing or something. But it starts off with Martha being struggling to understand them. You know, she's talking to this one who's got a broken arm. And she's kind of, of like having this communication problem. But then throughout the rest of the story... She kind of has this understanding with them. She kind of, um, later on there's this scene where she's um, talking to them with this map. And she's kind of getting this idea. It's like, right, I can kind of understand you. We live there. And we are here in this map. Um, and so on. And then throughout the story, um, she befriends this one hearth um, to which she goes on the surface after the uh, it's revealed where the source is. And she just talks to the hearth completely fine, seemingly understanding him, or at least um, she pretends to understand him at least. It's really confusing, it's really odd, and um, it does kind of harm her uh, plot line. It is kind of annoying as well that despite her very limited um, time in series 4, appearing in um, uh, so far in this two part, in the last two parts in this story, but she again is separated from the doctor for the most part luckily however she does still have a great screen presence in this story as uh, her narrative basically is treated like the b plot uh, a back of the ranch storytelling a common trope that's uh, used in uh, in narratives 
and um, she has some very great interesting moments. Um, there's this uh, really interesting moment I find where she's going onto the surface and she's kind of having this befriending um, this alien creature, this hoth, and she gets basically, she falls down and she falls into this um, quicksand and this hoth is trying to help her but, um, but uh, struggles from the, uh, from how it's all angled. So he just jumps in and chucks Martha out, leaving himself to die in the quicksand. And Martha's just there, bursted in tears, and is just stunned by um, that this half sacrificed itself for her. For her, uh, we, we presume this is the same half that uh, she rescued uh, Fixer's shoulder earlier on in the episode. However, I don't know if that was confirmed or not. But um, there is that kind of bond there between them. And that is uh, semi-interesting. It's not gone into too depth, uh, mainly because this is one part long. Um, but it is kind of shows that Martha has, has influenced this, this one individual who we, we, don't, we don't understand a word of, uh, to the point where he would sacrifice himself for Martha. And Martha... Um, uh, cares about this character just enough that she would just stop. She she's basically risking herself because after in the setting uh, she is uh, basically being poisoned by radio radiation and if she stays on the surface too long she could die. But she but she basically stops to have this um, to break down in tears for this individual. It's affected her that much and that I find is rather interesting because they it's. It's strange because it's in some way it's not been told enough, but at the same time it's told too much. The elements on Martha's storyline are completely wrong, but it's in a way where it's kind of interesting and does get you emotionally hooked, um, in a sense, in, in that narrative. Um, as Martha just pushes on to try and get to the source uh, as quicker than anyone else. Um, and they're basically this, this uh, the characters are all trying to get to one point, this one place on the map, um, which is the resolution of the source. Um, now, let's talk about Donna, because Donna throughout most of series four so far has been very good. And all the writers so far have been very great at um, uh, implementing her into the stories. Uh, some uh, writers struggle to get companions in the narrative, get, making them just um, the, one in quest, the one who questions the Doctor, the one who gets captured and stuff. Uh, but so far, Donna has been great at playing an incident role in the narrative and the emotional impacts of the story. Yeah! Um, uh, it's kind of the weakest one so far for Donna. She does have this emotional... Hookage. However, uh, unlike previous stories so far, which is kind of, kind of makes the story interesting, in which the stories about Martha, uh, Donna, sorry, learning about her character and her relationships uh, and new things from the Doctor, here she is kind of learning from uh, teaching the Doctor and helping him, uh, being like a supportive figure to uh, to the Doctor and his relationship with. Jenny, and that's such fascinating, and I love how um, Catherine Tate just knows how to tone down her her uh, exaggerated self uh, for these lovely smaller moments with um, uh, with the Doctor. But in terms of her in the actual plot, now this is something which a lot of people criticise this for, and it's fair enough. Basically, she starts noticing around this world that... Um, there's these um, signs everywhere of numbers uh, with only slight changes between them. And they seem to be counting down the closer they get to the source. And this seems to be building up some sort of mystery, some sort of something which will be a vital part of the narrative and fix and to change everything. And that's what the writer uh, intended as when we get to where the source is kept. It turns out the source is the spaceship in which humans and half arrived. And the doctor reads on his computer screen that 
Essentially what happened is that the ship crash landed on this planet. The captain died, leaving a, uh, uh, a power vacu vacuum. And so that's what started the war between the humans and the hearth. Nobody really betrayed anyone, but there was this power struggle where certain people thought that other people deserved to be, uh, to take over uh, leader. And so that's where all this big, um, this big war happening. However, from Donna's point of view, she notices this um, electronic sign. It's a sign um, which with the numbers, um, but uh, it's electronic, so it can change. It can be altered, and it's quickly she realizes that uh, because of her time as a prep and she's this um, mathematic, she's very good with numbers. Is that she realizes that this these signs are the dates, and each uh, each time these signs put up it's when they built this particular area of the base but something she has also noticed is that there's only been seven days seven days since this war uh could even be forged there was only seven days that this entire war this entire civilization um uh, panned out this is a massive issue for the story um the main, main part, the main issue with it, which is like the, the biggest issue, is that it doesn't really change anything. The, they treat it like this big twist, this revelation, and the Doctor's like, oh, Madonna, you're a genius. Um, and the audience is supposed to be uh, led into this as good as, as a, a very vital part of the story. But it does nothing to infect it. So the war broke out um, in a week, and uh, it turns out that... Um, the generation process because people keep uh, dying don't remember when the war started um, but it doesn't really impact the narrative and the emotional capability it just means that the week is the war is now shorter than they originally thought and um, also a massive issue is um, this whole idea that um, there's this, also this Basically, part of the revolution, the revelation of this is that um, it turns out this whole them wars fighting for forever about the humans in the hearth and all that. Um, it's been passed down by their myths, by their legends that um, what they're looking for is the breath of a goddess. But it turns out it's not. It's made in a in a factory. It's a perfectly scientific uh, thing that the humans have created. Why don't the soldiers know this? There's no good explanation. They mention that like, they've been mythologizing it, but how can they? Most of these people got their memories, got their, their source for their information through the data banks of the computer. How did they mythologize their, their civilization in under a week? It's a massive plot hole for this story, uh, and one massive plot hole that. Uh, really hinders an in the enjoyment of the narrative for most people and and a lot of people just literally just this is the this, the uh, the part of the story where they're just like no this is just absolutely dumb and it absolutely hurts the narrative um, also as well it's here that Martha reunites with the doctor after um, uh, walking heavily for a long time in the the wastelands uh, as they're all finally in the the ending climax of this story where the, the war is just about to break out and the Doctor has discovered that there's this um, uh, this room in the ship full of plants um, and they find the source, this um, containment which actually is used to terraform unhabitable planets uh, into hamnable ones. Essentially, think of it like the Genesis machine in the Star Trek universe. Um, oh my god! This is the Wrath of Khan! It has just hit me! <laughs> um, but yeah, um, awesome to note that these scenes are actually filmed in Swansea, um, somewhere which I am very familiar with, so uh, props up to that. Um, I've actually been uh, at this location multiple times um, in my childhood. Very, uh, very cool. But anyway, uh, the Doctor basically calls this this truce. And um, he basically looks into Jenny's eyes and just like, you are amazing. This whole um, 
thing is amazing. Uh, the war is over. There's no reason to fight. You can now come with me and we can show you the universe. However, the main leader of the humans um, basically wanted bloodshed. He wanted to just exterminate um, the half and has no intentions of befriending him. So he can point a gun and tries to shoot the doctor only for Jenny to get, in, um, get involved, taking the bullet and shooting her dead. The the idea that you know somebody jumps in and ju and stops the bullet is something that's very cliched in in fiction and sometimes um, it's usually played up for laughs. But in this scene, it takes it extraordinarily serious, and uh, the irony of it does not um, does not go over the it go just goes right over the writer's heads, I should say as. The scene just plays um, uh, very cliched in that regard. But we do get this really sad moment where the Doctor is looking at this person, this chance of him not being alone, so where he can start a family. His daughter, this connection to his previous life where he was a family man, and not only that, Time Lord, you know? Uh, she is a Time Lord. And, and he's basically like, it's like, you're not going to die yet. You go in to see these amazing worlds, these amazing planets with me. And she smiles. She's enthusiastic about it. Again, Google it. She's dying, but she's still got this like daydream, um, uh, sexy uh, um, personality about her uh, before dropping dead. And the Doctor is like, maybe she's a Time Lord. She has Time Lord DNA. She's a part of me. Um, wait too long, she might, um, she wait for a bit, she might regenerate. And Martha, now this bit is really odd, Martha then goes, she is a clone of you, but maybe not enough to have the regeneration process. And the doctor's just like, um, no, um, uh, she was too much like me, that was the problem. Why, like, I know, like, it should, like, happen, but... You could have waited a little bit longer to see if she would regenerate or not. It's a very strange concept, especially you know what time laws are supposed to be, um, uh, and what the and what the idea of regeneration is. It's supposed to be part of like a genetically uh, idea thing, and it's really strange how the doctor doesn't click. It's like right, she. Um, I mean, he does click that she can regenerate, but the fact that he just gives up uh, hope of her regenerating is so early on. It's very strange, but, you know, he's um, emotionally pained. And it even gets to a point where the Doctor just gets up. There's this really intense heartbeat sound as he gets up, picks up the gun, and puts it up to the human leader's head. As everybody is just in awe that the Doctor would even, like, consider this. And you can see the pain that he's going through. And nobody's stopping him. As it, everybody kind of feels like he's justified in this. And I love the how... How long this scene kind of plays out. It's not. It's still a short scene. But it's long for uh, the idea of. To an audience that you know. The doctor is tempted to shoot him. To shoot him. Kind of implying that he was tempted. He was tempted. But then he turns the gun around. Um, and puts it into the guy's face. And is just like. Um, I would never would. And he shouts out. And he's like. Make that the foundations of your society. The man who never would. And so. The Doctor takes uh, Martha back to her own time period um, as the Doctor, um, uh, Donna, uh, say goodbye to Martha. Martha basically is, tells Donna, it's like, um, uh, uh, thank you for the offer of travelling with you again, uh, but I need to go home, I have my own life. Um, they also mention what happened at the start of the story. Essentially, the TARDIS was brought there because of Jenny. However, uh, because of the Doctor's uh, connection with Jenny in terms of the timelines. However, the TARDIS appeared uh, earlier so that the, tar the Doctor can genetically uh, create Jenny, creating a paradox. The TARDIS travelled there because of Jenny, but the TARDIS arriving there is what created Jenny in the first place, creating this sort of paradox loop and which made the TARDIS travel there in the first place. And so, uh, and then that's technically the end. However, we do have a extra scene in which um, uh, they're basically, 
the human and the hoth are basically uh, about to basically bury Jenny. However, some sort of um, gas, which seemingly is regeneration energy, however, according to behind the scenes, it's actually uh, part of the source, uh, escapes Jenny's mouth and she is revived. She is alive, all well and dandy, and she goes out exploring the universe, hidden out of future appearances with Jenny. For those of you interested, Big Finish did actually make a spin-off series of Jenny, um, which we will not be tackling because I don't own any of those stories, sadly. But um, Jenny uh, was basically teased. Now, here's a fun fact. Russell T. Davis actually um, basically told uh, Greenhorn to basically just kill her off. Uh, she's dead. She's not going to return. It was Stephen Moffat that actually suggested to Russell T. Davis and um, Greenhorn that they should uh, bring her back and tease her for later involvements. Um, with the implication that Stephen Moffat would do something with her in his series, which never came to pass. So why did he do that? Was there plans to bring Jenny into the 11th or 12th Doctor eras? No idea, but um, whatever happened didn't seem to come to pass and it seemed to be teasing a, a spin-off of sorts which uh, never came into fruition in fact Russell T Davis has implied that as soon as um, she escaped into that spaceship the ship crashed and she died almost instantly after the credits ended um, and that is um, the doctor's daughter overall it's a pretty weak story the narrative itself um, it's got a great set in a great environment of this um, underground war between this uh, these dirty, filthy humans that have cloned, that have basically survived through cloning, as well as them fight, fighting fish people with bubble talk. Um, but the narrative itself, on a flowing level, um, is kind of dull. Um, Jenny is just not an interesting character, and um, there's just there's just not enough interesting aspects of the story to go around. However, there are interesting aspects. The main vocal point for this is the Doctor himself. The, the story emotionally messes up the Doctor um, in a sense as, as he's going through all of these emotions and his help with, the, uh, with Donna and Martha, uh, even though Martha is hardly with the Doctor in this story, um, uh, does are very interesting and Martha has her own little B-plot which um, has some interesting moments on, on it but overall it is it is a really weak narrative it's a really weak adventure I still say it's fun however I did enjoy it I still had a laugh and I still um, had good memories of watching it when it first aired but that's more of a personal thing um, so that's that's what I think about this episode so there you go that's um, uh, that is the doctor's daughter so join me next time when Gwen is about to get married. However, she is shocked by a revelation that is uh, promises to put a massive stick into her and Reese's relationship. That being that she is suddenly uh, largely pregnant. So I'll see you next time on the Doctor Who Marathon for Something Borrowed. And I'll see you next time on the Doctor Who Marathon. Ta-ra!